welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for what I'm sure will be a lively and engaging debate on a very important topic, artificial intelligence, or short, AI. I'm Simon Wost, your chair for the next 60 minutes, and my role is to ensure that we cover the essential topics of AI in healthcare and we leverage the wisdom of this panel. AI is undoubtedly one of the most exciting developments in healthcare today. And if we get it right, we will seize the opportunities from the yeah, data that's out there, um, and we will be able to improve clinical care, financial care, and also um, operational outcomes. It will, of course, also drive clinical gains to the yeah, person that needs most, the patients. But all this excitement and the opportunities also come with a sweat. So what's the sweat at the end? What's the fear? It can be about general AI taking over, it can be of yeah, algorithm taking jobs, or it can be the general um, threat of the new. So our aim today is to clear up some of the myths surrounding AI and assess the real status quo in healthcare. Furthermore, we want to understand what's needed to make AI a success. We also want to talk about what are yeah, the key success factors in healthcare and of course, how we can implement it and yeah, embrace it at the end. We have for audience today joining us from all over Europe and I invite you to ask questions that we will um, treat during the course of this panel. Yeah, but let me now start to introduce our panel. To my left, we have Professor Matthias Goyen, Chief Medical Officer Europe in GE Healthcare, a radiologist himself and a senior leader in shaping the ethics of AI. He's a true advocate of medical technology, being all about increasing the standards of care delivery. Welcome, Matthias. Thanks, Simon, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here today. Nice to have you. Next to him, we have got Dr. Claire Bloomfield. She's the Chief Operating Officer of the National Consortium of Intelligent Medical Imaging, short NCMI, at the University of Oxford. The vision of NCMI is to integrate expertise to accelerate the potential impact of AI in clinical imaging for patient benefit and for the industry. To do so, they use a unique multi-stakeholder team of expertise from the NHS, academia, industry and patient groups. Welcome, Claire. Thank you so much, Simon. Thanks for having me here. As well, we've got Nienke Boimer. I really appreciate the startup air here. Nienke is the business development director at Aidens, a startup company based in the Netherlands. Aidens boosts the first CE certified AI system called Ray Chest, and they're doing some more inspiring stuff, working with, together with audiologists, developers, scientists and hospitals to build further AI solutions um, for medical imaging analysis. Welcome as well. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to a great discussion today and questions from the, from the audience. Perfect. And finally, I would also like to introduce Dr. Valère Duzon, the Health and Life Science Director at Intel. His contribution today um, in the areas of technical regulation and compliance will be hugely valuable for our discussion. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for having me today. So thank you all for joining. Let's directly begin with the first question. Matthias, what's the fear of AI? Well, let me start with a quote that I just heard the other day. In 10 years, radiology will become the third leading cause of death. And when you hear statements like this, um, you, you understand that this is a ve very controversial topic. There is a lot of hype when we talk about the development of AI. I would say positive hype, and I hope we can talk today about applications of AI, where AI can really um, um, you know, help in clinical routine to make the life of um, technicians, um, radiologists, and uh, also clinicians much easier. But on the other hand, I would say there are voices you know, um, saying that uh, radiologists all go out of business. You know, the AI will take over, I would say, fueling fear, especially to radiologists. And uh, I, think, I think we all agree that um, the job description, I would say, of a radiologist will significantly change 
for sure there will be AI implemented into daily routine for repetitive tasks, for easy tasks, for, for boring tasks, if I may say so, being a radiologist myself. But uh, just think about what a radiologist does. A normal radiologist does much more than just looking at images. I mean, radiologists sit in, on tumor boards. Uh, and just think of the huge field of interventional radiology where there are skills needed that at least I cannot foresee, you know, that they will be taken over by, by, by algorithms. So mm -hmm. uh, I think radiologists do not need to worry too much um, about their job. And let's keep on focusing, what is the concept here of AI? It's not like AI versus um, 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 the radiologist, it's AI plus the radiologist. And uh, just, I have a question for you, um, Simon, just think about it. Would you sit on a plane without a pilot? You know, and we know that the autopilots, they have, um, you know, not replaced the human pilots, but have significantly, I would say, expanded their responsibilities. At a lot of airports, planes can automatically take off and land, but come on, would you sit on a plane, on a plane um, without a pilot? And, uh, you know, if I may add also, it's a little unfair that when, you know, an AI algorithm is compared to a radiologist just based on the assessment of a single disease or a subset of disease, because this, this really oversimplifies our, our daily job. We do much more than just, you know, looking at the diagnosis that, that are most common. We, we also have in mind, you know, uncommon diagnosis, rare diseases. And, uh, you know, having said that, I think uh, that uh, we have a great tool with AI uh, that can really help us. So I, I firmly believe that AI per se will, will not replace the radiologist. But I also believe that the radiologist leveraging the power of AI will in the end, um, 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 you know, um, succeed and the radiologist uh, not using AI will go out of business. Thanks for that. And to answer, I would probably not go into a plane without a pilot. <laughs> Doesn't feel right. Um, Valer, from the industry standpoint. Yeah, your uh, yeah. F f firstly, I'd like to, to agree with m what Matthias just said and uh, uh, say that uh, first I want to make clear that we absolutely do not foresee that AI will replace healthcare professionals mm -hmm. in any way. However, we envisage that it will significantly transform the way these professionals work and reorganize the way healthcare is delivered to the patient. Professionals will see AI materializing as new features in the software they use daily, saving them enormous time by taking care of relatively simple and repetitive actions. For example, a radiologist numerating the spine vertebras on an X-ray image, it can already be done by AI. In the same way, voice recognition, automatic language translations are already features that use AI that some healthcare professionals use daily. Healthcare professionals will also be what we call augmented. They will be fed by the software with relevant insights about their patients. For instance, at the point of prescribing, they will be given warning prompts about patient cases of prior drug intolerance. For the radiologist again, or the pathologist, AI will materialize in what we envisage as the most advanced AI, this is pre-screening of X-ray images or microscope images that will save them a lot of incredibly precious time. This will help radiologists push the limits of their examinations further and for many more cases. I think all that is really thrilling. Let, let me just make yeah. a comment here. I mean, you know what every radiologist dream would be? Don't show me the normals, you know? So have an algorithm that could stratify, uh, you know, images. And I don't want to see the normal stuff. I only want to see the cases where it's most likely that there really is pathology. I understand. Second, as was alluded to on the introduction today, AI is indeed being fueled by an explosion in data. This is happening now because of the tremendous progress of computing thanks to Moore's law and the progress in storage capacity made more recently. AI's fundamental concepts were already known in the 70s, like the concept of convolutional neural network. However, it's only now that we talk about AI because we only very recently started to be able to turn these concepts into practice. This is largely in thanks to investments by companies like Intel and also the availability of more computing capacity. 
And this will be a particularly important requirement in the coming years to fully implement the concepts and provoke the expected technological shift. Another prerequisite to support the explosion of data and take us toward true AI will be the production of larger and larger structured and annotated data sets that will feed algorithms' learnings. The more structured and annotated data we will have, the better the AI will be. Mm -hmm. And Simon, I believe what's currently the most important challenge in AI is that this data preparation remains a very demanding process. And in this case, it's clear that the amount of work required for data preparation is huge. And yes, from this perspective, I can personally understand why professionals might fear it. Totally understood. I mean, I hear a lot about data and computing power that we have right now to bring this to work. Ninka, I know that your company is doing something like this. Yeah, I, I actually like really like this question as a first question because I think we shouldn't ignore um, here in this room that there isn't hype around AI, right? It's, um, and I think for us, there's an obligation today to, to also show that, of course, there's the hype but we should look beyond the hype, right? And that's also where I'm quite exciting. Also, the work we're doing at Aidens with Phi Chest at the moment is that, um, yes, there are already opportunities today to improve the workflow, um, take away mundane or repetitive tasks, and that there's a great potential there. And I think we will talk about it later. And it's also an opportunity potential for, in our case, then the radiologists, right? Because w there's an, startups like us, of course, we create uh, employability, we create jobs, mm -hmm. but we also invite radiologists to work with us, right? To help us enhance the training set, to help us validate, to help us bring it to the clinical workflow. And I think that's quite an exciting time, um, which, uh, which also maybe gives a new spin on the job they're having today. Um, and that what I don't want to say is that we shouldn't ignore the fact there's fear, right? And uh, Maybe we tap into that later as well about the AI and the black box, mm -hmm. for sure. And it puts an obligation on companies like us um, and the wider industry to explain, right? What are we doing? How do we train algorithms? How do we validate them? And how do we bring them to clinical practice? But, um, but there I would also pass the ball a bit back and say, uh, yes, of course, there's an obligation on our side, but I think also um, there's an obligation to the medical professionals. I mean, AI is here to stay, is my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in your curriculum and the training, um, it would be very, it should be uh, something that should be addressed, right? How do you read the outcomes of, uh, of, an, of a solution like PhiChest, for example? Perfect. Thanks a lot. Claire, I know that you oversee the entire ecosystem at the end. And um, yeah, what are your points here? Well, I, th I think we've heard from some of the stakeholder groups that we bring together in and see, we say the radiology perspective, startups and SMEs and big tech companies. And I think what we found and the experience has been that, I don't know if there's it's a fear, but there's certainly how do you grasp the opportunity that's available? There is more data, there are more chances to bring everybody together, but it's realizing that and seeing how you can actually transform that. And I don't think we have all the answers yet. So discussions like this help to bring everybody together, but there are certainly opportunities to think around how do we engage? How do hospitals actually engage? How do I approach an SME or a company to engage with the work that they're doing? How do I think about deployment and actually adopting the technology once it's been developed? And we don't have the answers around how they'll be commissioned, what the reimbursement processes will be, who's going to fund it, will they sit into hardware, software, some solution that sits somewhere between the two. And so there's more questions. I don't think it's necessarily fear, but just what do we do? How do we engage in this? But I think everybody's keen and enthusiastic to do more. I think there's probably also some things to think about, about how we bring the patients and the public with us on this journey. So there's a critical component to the ethics of patient data use and thinking through commercialization, how we protect patients and public interest, but also making sure that we can see new products progress and develop and take their place in the market. So it's an exciting time, but I think there's probably more questions than answers right now. Exciting times. I mean, I, just to, I scribbled down some things here. One is AI is real and it's here to stay. I like this one very clearly. Um, we are actually right now able to address it because we have the data and computing power, as you um, said, Valer. Um, we said like it will not be AI versus human. Matthias, you clearly said that it's AI augmenting um, radiologists. 
And uh, another, again, I, I stress, I would not jump into a plane without a, a pilot. Um, let me address maybe the first audience question right now that I have here on my screen. So um, the question is, will AI revolutionize the way how we read images and how yeah, work is performed across the enterprise? I think, Claire, you mentioned before that Insimi is working with various stakeholders. What's your point here? Well, I'll try and take a macro perspective and maybe defer to Matthias on actually the radiologist <laughs> experience of imaging. But um, I think we can see that there'll be a range of potential ways that you'll see AI integrate and that in the short term, that's likely to look like back office operational functions. So not the things you see and experience as a patient, but working behind the scenes seamlessly to improve care, scheduling of appointments, supporting the bo appointment booking system, scheduling of scans. So really not something that sounds particularly exciting and transformative, but should really allow people to focus on the patient facing work rather than um, worrying about trying to make the most efficient use of operational systems. But I think we are all hoping that we'll see it actually realize its potential in terms of integrated diagnostics, earlier detection of disease and onward treatment stratification. But somewhere in the middle, you'll start to see that hybrid model of AI working alongside radiologists in that augmented intelligence space where you see the two working in synergy, which I think we'll see sort of highlighting cases for abnormalities, triaging some of those images. So there'll be steps along the way, but I think the starting point is the quick wins will be in the spaces where nobody will see it. It'll be behind the scenes and hopefully we'll just help empower people to do more work. I, I couldn't agree more, Clay, Claire, if, if I may here. The best AI is the one that you don't see at all, that's seamlessly working behind the seas and uh, does its magic, I would say. And uh, uh, so I was just thinking about the term artificial intelligence, and you already, um, as Simon mentioned that, maybe we should ref rephrase artificial intelligence and say augmented intelligence uh, instead, because there is not much artificial or there uh, about artificial intelligence, you know? it's. Uh, it's uh, inspired by people, um, it's created by people, yeah. it's impacting people. So I would say AI is, pr is pretty human. And uh, uh, you said one of the, one of the tasks of AI is to uh, potentially prioritize images. For example, um, you know, uh, propose those 60 of out of a thousand MR images yep. where it's most likely that the diagnosis can be found. And I mean, this is something um, um, which of course makes the life of the radiologist easier. But, but let me challenge you here, if, if we go one step further, do we still need the traditional images? I mean, I know that our um, you know, surgeons and the clinicians, they are so used to looking at images, but could you envision an AI algorithm that is generating a report just based on the source images because we know it's the source image images where the information yeah. is and not the MIP reconstructions, not the post-process images that we are so used to, to seeing it. So maybe let's see what the future holds. I mean, this 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 is. This is, this is very interesting, I guess. The other question is, will clinicians um, um, you know, accept just a report based on source images, kind of bypassing the traditional images? One day, maybe. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> but I see um, a lot of interesting stuff here. One thing you mentioned that I um, liked a lot is the best AI is the one behind the scenes that's embedded in the workflow and does it magic there. That's what you said, literally. And the second one, I also um, think like that there will be a kind of phasing. First, it will act behind the scenes in back of the tasks, but then it will develop more and more towards um, clinical, the clinical world. And that's a perfect transition to our next section. Okay. Our next section of the debate is to discuss how and where AI will have the most impact in healthcare. And I think you all have to, um, to tell something about that. We all agreed that AI is a reality. It's a fact right now. We've also agreed that if we are able to adopt it and harness all the power of data, we will literally be better off than that. And I mean, if you see how much data at the end the average hospital produces, it's 50 petabyte. So um, this comes from images, it comes from the EMR, um, and it's only coming from within the hospital right now. If you then would even go further outside the hospital where you have got data like genomics, um, data that comes from trackers, there's a lot of power there, right? But currently, we are only using 3% of this data. So imagine how strong it would be if we are able to leverage the 97% missing at this point in time. 
And if you look into today's world, there are these back office algorithms for sure, but there are also existing ones in the clinical space. I mean, I read recently about an algorithm that helps you to detect um, like critical conditions at the point of care, and then also helps to prioritize this for a doctor. Um, I mean, this is, at the end, helping us to provide better healthcare for sure. And I'm pretty sure all of you have a viewer point on this, and all of you have, um, have points to share. So maybe I start with you, um, Inke. Um, in the startup sure. world, for sure, you trade all these innovations, or you treat them. Um, what are, where do you see the biggest impact in the short one for, of AI? Yeah, and this is where it gets exciting, right? At least where I get excited. And I want to just refer back to where we concluded in the last section is the best AI is actually the one you don't see. And I would like actually like to add to that and which embraces the current infrastructure, right? And is easily to fit in. So, and that's very much aligned with what we're trying to do at Aidens as well. Um, where do I see the most impact today? I think that's, um, I can only talk from our own example. So we brought Phychest at the moment to the market uh, and we have customers using with it. And, and Phychest really addresses one of those tasks where I think AI can make impact today. So it's, mm -hmm. we do, it's, it's detection and reporting of pulmonary nodules on CT. And, um, and I don't think, and Matthias, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I don't think I'm, insulting anyone in this room if I'm saying that detection and reporting of pulmonary nodules is not the highlight of the radiologist's work day. Mm -hmm. um, but we but yes can tell for sure. <laughs> exactly, right? Uh, but it, it's very important for the patient that this is done very accurately mm -hmm. because everyone knows that um, early detection is making a difference to a patient's life. So it's important. And I think here it's a really nice combination of where a radiologist and a computer system like PhiChess can help each other. We support the radiologist to be up all day. Even if it's in the afternoon or at the end of the afternoon, we help find those nodules and report them. And I think it's one of those repetitive and mundane tasks, which is not difficult for the radiologist to do. Mm -hmm but it is not always fun to do. So I think that's, if you ask me, where does it make impact today? Mm -hmm. I think that's where it makes impact. Mm -hmm. um, saying that, however, I also want to dream a bit further towards the future, because that's also why we're here, right? I think, mm -hmm. yes, this is where it makes impact today. Um, we're currently certified as Phychest as a second or concurrent user. That means that we're a, a AI assistant or augmented mm -hmm. um, intelligence. Mm -hmm. But um, I think at some point also the radiology would benefit if we would take one step further and say, if you, if you do a CT scan reporting, you will look at the nodules, Aidens will look for you at the nodules, mm -hmm. and, you will own, and you will have the opportunity to look at the complete patient picture, right? Um, and that will, I think, will be the real game changer and will improve the quality of care because the radiology, we put them in the strength of looking at the complete patient picture and let the mundane task, the repetitive task, to a computer. So you focus the time of the radiologist to where he yeah. makes the biggest difference. Exactly. And just to focus on the pulmonary nodule stuff, I mean, there are greater things in life, I fully agree, than <laughs> reporting on 30 known lung metastases in a patient with a colon cancer who comes every, every three months for staging. Yeah. And, uh, and, and this is very much in line with what I said. I mean, the repetitive task, the boring task, let's say it, it's boring. And uh, you, a radiologist's time is, uh, uh, can be used uh, better, I would yeah. say, to to either talk to patients to free up some time or to, um, to look at more fancy stuff, I would yeah. say. And speaking of um, artificial intelligence and, 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 and analytics, they can be applied at different levels in the health system. I mean, f the first level would be um, that we implement AI capabilities right into our machines, into our CT scanners, ultrasound devices, X-ray scanners. You just mentioned um, um, in, in your intro um, um, that we now have um, systems that prioritize images. And uh, uh, you probably know that we have a mobile X-ray system that is able to detect a collapsed lung, a pneumothorax, which is a big pain point on the ICU in hospitals, especially if it's three o'clock in the morning and um, the tech is doing some X-rays. And um, studies have shown that it takes up to eight hours for a radiologist 
neurologists to actually look at an x-ray uh, to make the diagnosis. I mean, making the diagnosis is, thir is 30 seconds, uh, yeah. but it takes up to eight hours because the radiologist on call is probably just doing um, you know, a trauma case or a CT um, um, of the brain. So I think having a system at point of care that tells the, the, the technician kind of alerts that it's very likely this, that this patient has a pneumothorax makes a lot of sense because then the technician can either call the radiologist or can send the images with high priority into the PAC system. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, um, you know, is the radiologist better than the AI or is the AI outperforming the radiologist? I think it's just about prioritizing images. And this is, I think, one really added value of AI. And then I would say if we go to the next level, um, AI um, can do its magic at an institutional level, mm -hmm. uh, streamlining workflows in radiology departments, in private practices. And uh, you can even elevate that and think of entire networks Networks or hospitals uh, where you have so-called command centers where you use predictive analytics and systems engineering to better manage flow and patient experience um, in hospitals. So, um, I mean, come on, you, think of yourself. When you go to a hospital and uh, you're a patient at least at some point, you don't want to get your diagnosis from a computer. At least I don't want to get my diagnosis from a computer. Yeah. I want to talk to a person, ideally a radiologist <laughs> or, 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 a, or a clinician. No, and, and, and if, if the radiologist made his diagnosis based on some smart algorithm, that's awesome. It's more accurate, it's faster, it's, it's great. But in the end, this human connection will never go away, not even with the best AI. I mean, to also summarize here, what I heard from you in KS, that at the end, AI has most impact where we have data and repetitive tasks because there we can optimize yeah. and free up time for the radiologist or the physician as such to spend time where they should spend time with patients. And secondly, I very much liked the three levels you described, um, Matthias. At first, you have it on a machine level or on a PAX level. The next step would be to then see how entire departments can um, benefit AI and last but not least then entire ecosystems maybe with the command center you mentioned. Let's take another question from the, um, from the um, audience here. The question is, how will AI be implemented by the different industry players? Um, so yeah, what do we have to do to, to implement it? I mean, well, yeah, I think, um, no, Claire, you um, worked mainly on that. Um, well, so we in Insimi, we've got a range of different partners mm. in the industry space. So both SMEs and startup, but also GE Healthcare is one of our partners. And I think they can face quite different challenges. And again, at those three levels that Matty has talked about, that you can be trying to acquire data, test and validate your solution, but also be looking to deploy innovations that you've already developed and are ready to go to market. Mm -hmm. But engaging and trying to find either ways to commercialize and gather data, to develop the algorithms or deploy those are different struggles for the industry partners we've found. So what we're aiming to do with initiatives like Ensemi is just lower the barrier to make it slightly easier for new companies to emerge to say, help us find data from across the UK ecosystem to test and work on, but also sort of talking in the command center or the numerothorus suite. How do you actually deploy that? How do you evaluate that in the real world setting? Because a test set of data, I think we, we can speak to this, as test sets don't look like real world data. So that shift from development and testing into deployment can be quite a challenge. So hopefully we'll be putting in place a system that should make that easier for people to engage with. Well, yeah, from your point of view, I mean, I know that you do a lot of work around change management. I think it's important to also address this deployment. Yeah, and also Intel is a key player in, in this space. And first, I'd like to say I agree with what you've just said, Claire. Um, at Intel, we continuously work uh, in collaboration with our partners, with the original equipment manufacturer partners, independent software vendor partners, mm -hmm. system integrators, in order to ease the adoption by end users of our new generation of AI-based solutions. AI should materialize in technology users' lives seamlessly, almost invisibly. Talking about work complexity, our users, especially in healthcare, are telling us that we have already reached some limits. So we listen to them and AI comes at the time in, history, in the history of computer science when adding more complexity will probably not be possible. 
AI needs to simplify users' lives, augment their capabilities and velocity at creating content, at managing, at even at solving patient cases. To make this happen, AI needs to be implemented at the right place in the information system. For instance, if an AI service is very compute intensive, let's take the example of an inference service for radiologists performing post-treatment of X-ray images, it will not be tolerated by the user to send the X-ray image back to the data center, have it screened there, and get it back to the user, because it would be too long. In addition, whilst today most AI algorithms are trained using graphical graphical processing units known as GPUs, which is the brute force in data centers today. Scaling will require developers to tune these algorithms on more traditional compute engines as energy consumption will become more and more critical in IT infrastructure total cost of ownership. Therefore, the AI will have to be implemented as close as possible to the edge. Intel offers a development framework called OpenVINO that's been used by GE Healthcare to develop the AI-based service to pre-screen for pneumothorax that Matthias just, just talked about. Mm -hmm. In this case, all computations are performed by hardware that is already present inside the X-ray system, so the radiologist can get the result almost instantly and there is no additional hardware cost to get the service. This is the way AI should materialize in healthcare. And Matthias, the implementation of AI will bring solution architecture efficiency challenges. Every inference and training calculation will preferably not be performed at the remote data center far from where the data is produced, I believe. Maybe to take a little bit of this discussion to another level, what would you think each of you um, at the end is needed and how can individuals um, yeah, prep themselves to basically um, use AI and, and deploy it. And maybe I start with you, Matthias, and then we go around the... Yeah, the first of all, you have to be open to that topic. I mean, you have two choices, right? Either you can uh, sit back, mm -hmm. relax in the beginning, in mm -hmm. the end you don't relax anymore, and see what everyone else is doing, right? Uh, leveraging the power of AI, really using it. And then in the end, um, uh, you know, in order to not go out of business, you also have to do it. Or why not be an early adapter? Try to shape it, probably not in every field, but you're a specialist, let's say, in... Uh, as Ninka said, you're a thoracic radiologist. Maybe you, you, you have some fancy algorithm, you work together with, with startup companies, and uh, um, I, I think this would, would be my advice. There is no opt-out. I mean, mm. the, it's not science fiction, it, it's science fact. It's, it's happening as we speak. So uh, I, I, I would strongly encourage everyone, I mean, to, to be open to that topic. It doesn't mean uh, to accept everything, but just to be open and uh, uh, I'm sure AI will not go away and we just have to use it as a helping tool to make our lives easier. Th this is my firm belief. Well, as Matthew sort of says, it's being open to being involved and all the audience who are participating in the webinar, they're already engaging in the process. They're performing part of the dialogue. We've had questions coming in. Everyone's watching is an early adapter. Right, so exactly. Congratu so congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> no. So that's right. instead of saying you're already in and part of the club, really. And so I think it's how do you expand that and keep asking more questions. And I think the fact that we've got different groups coming together today having the conversation just reflects nobody's got all the answers. Um, it's not about having all the solutions to the problems, but it is, as Matthew says, it's just beginning to engage and um, upskilling and thinking about becoming maybe an AI ambassador in your own location. So how do you champion what you think is necessary? And try to push the little incremental steps, they all add up. So just sort of putting it back out there, going back to your workforce and saying, this is something we should be engaging in. Do you see a difference at the end from the kind of professions, physician, technician, um, IT in this process? I think, well, I think there's a role for everybody. So this is a truly interdisciplinary undertaking. Nobody's going to have all the solutions. We need machine learning, statistical expertise. You need clinical input. You need the patient, public voice, ethicists. 
Um, and all of those people coming together, I think it is, it's a dialogue and conversation. That's how mm -hmm. we'll see the best solutions coming forward. It won't be somebody with all the answers. Nobody, I think, has to fear the fact that they're going to be left behind unless they choose to be. Again, if you want to wait and sit back, then it may be that you, you miss the party, but the party's here for everybody if they want to come and join. But I think it's important to, I, I like what Claire said, right? There's a role for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm honest, I think the, the discussion so far has been much more on the, on, on the radiologists or the medical professionals. And I think it would be good to also recognize more that everyone has a role, right? Because I think an IT manager or a medical phys physicist has a role as well. Um, and I like coming back to what, what is needed. I like what Claire said in the beginning as well. I think what they're working on in Oxford is exactly what what it what's required, Thank you, right? Ninka. <laughs> yeah, but it is it is companies working like us who don't have who have a bit of the clinical knowledge, obviously, by the medical professionals that work for us. But you only know how good an AI algorithm is once it's 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 in clinical practice, right? And to have that ecosystem working together. Is, is very important, I think. Right. And it is, it's great. It's even we've all been discussing, there's new partnerships and collaborations yeah. I think will emerge off the back of this discussion. And I think there is that sense that if you want to engage, there's starting yeah. to be a mechanism to do that and come and be involved. And just to conclude, but just to conclude on that is that, yes, there's a role for everyone, but um, I think the word was already mentioned, the AI champion. Okay. You require someone who takes the uh, ownership, right? Because what we see uh, is that, yes, you need to include everyone, but sometimes you miss the accountability or the ownership for someone who really takes this process of making it a success on their shoulders and, and gets everyone on board, right? So, And, and as, you, as you mentioned, Linke, if I may, um, sure. let's not only focus on the radiologists. Exactly. What about our technologists? Yeah. I mean, for example, MR technologists, they are a scarce yeah. resource. So just another example, we have implemented AI into our MR scanners. Um, you know this, when you start an MR scan, you do a scout scan, an overview yeah. scan. And this is a very generic scan and, and, and the, the tech has really manual pres manually prescribed slices and yeah. see where, for example, the brain is. And now we have a smart scout scan. So the scout scan detects automatically is this um, a small patient, a challenging patient, where is the brain? And then automatically selects the slices and prescribes the slices and um, the techs love it. The, yeah. the, the yeah. techs really love it because it makes their life easier. I mean, perfect. What would you do is the thing that um, we can do as industry? What do you think is the one thing we could do to make, at the end, this AI more tangible for people? Anybody for wants stories? To? I don't know. I think some, we've described yeah. a few I would say here. shut up and listen to the customer. Really. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we really have to know what are the pain points in clinical yeah. radiology mm -hmm. in the hospital. Really listen to the radiologists and not think we have some awesome uh, AI and no one needs it. So it's the other way around, really. Listen, these are the pain points. We want to solve that problem together with the clinician. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, it, it, it's about data quality and, yeah. and stuff like that because we all know garbage in, garbage out, and algorithm can only be as good as the data that you feed that algorithm. But this is another, uh, another big topic, you know? Yeah. What is good data? What is curated in, in data? But I think our role is to listen and uh, really solve clinical pain points. Yeah, and I think to, to add to that is also be historically aware. Um, <laughs> What we do, I mean, as Phytest is, is obviously for, for, for looking at the lungs, but uh, computer-aided diagnostics isn't new, right? There are learnings there today why in the past that might not always have been so successful. And, and I think, um, yes, the technology is new, but some of the concepts aren't new, right? So I would also be historically aware, understand from the customer why things didn't work in the past, yeah and try to build on that, right? I think that's a very important, at least what we try to do as well. And you have a learning curve and don't exactly. get demotivated if, yeah. if in the beginning uh, you, you really have pushbacks and uh, yeah. things don't work. It's, it's not a quarter business, I would say. Um, a <laughs> no. term I know very well since I joined the corporate world. No, it, it's a paradigm shift. I mean, you really need to, um, you know, you, it's a change process. It's not just as a chairman, here is the AI algorithm that I bought for you. Yeah. Have a great day. It's, this is 
not the way it works. So we really need, you know, radiologists and technologists make them ambassadors to the idea yeah. and really use AI. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, great points. I mean, to close this section, what I see clearly here is, um, what I liked a lot is that there's a role for everyone. This comment was a clear one um, that's needed, but also with all the pros and cons afterwards. We have to enable people to do so. Um, another thing I really liked is this concept of an AI champion, whoever this might be. I mean, who would this be from your point of view in a company? I don't think there has to be one solution. I think if somebody's committed and visionary and are keen yeah. to enthuse and empower other people, mm -hmm. it could be it can be radiologists, it can be startup CEOs, it can be operational people. I don't think that there's one size fits all, but I think it is understanding the different stakeholder needs and just yeah. saying I'm here to help not just mm -hmm. me but everybody get through and this. It grows natural. It grows natural. Yeah. You cannot say as a chairman, you are my you are my champion here, right? No, and you need to be have a willingness to break silos sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So sometimes you need to come with a thick skin, I think. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, there were also notions around, um, yeah, collaboration, which perfectly yeah, goes into the next part, which is our third um, section we're going to talk about. Yeah, the last part is at the end to understand what's needed that AI will be a success, right? There are many things and many questions that come to mind. So what are the things we have to get right from yeah, across the ecosystem and as individual players to um, yeah, make AI a success and to embrace at the end AI? And there, there are many of these things. It could be what are the ethics, it could be what are the organizational steps we have to take. It could as well be um, yeah, how do we have to influence our companies um, to, to get there. Matthias, I mentioned before that you um, do a lot of strong work in, in AI ethics. So um, maybe you have an answer to all these questions that we have already <laughs> out there. Yeah. I, I, might have, I might have my answer, one, one answer, and I mean this obviously is a very, very important topic and to mitigate potential harms we need new approaches to technology development and that is why we as Geo Healthcare came up with with a couple of AI principles you know okay. and they can be easily found on our webpage for everyone who is who is uh, who is um, listening um, right now but basically they say that AI systems exist again to augment um, mm. human intelligence and they must uh, be designed for the benefit safety and also privacy of the patient and kind of be a trusted steward of the data data and insights and of course be transparent transparent and uh, not be in a black box. We'll probably have a chance to talk about that um, that a little bit later. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that if we apply those AI principles, we can, I would say, responsibly embrace AI and, and not fear it. Mm -hmm. I'm just building on that, I think if we really do want to embrace this opportunity, it's about people coming together. So Matthias has alluded to the fact that AI isn't really artificial, it is in fact human. And I think what we'll see is that it's for people and it's by people. And so what keeps coming back for me and for things like in CME is how do we collaborate effectively? How do you bring the stakeholders to the table to find clinical unmet needs, to address the quality issues around data and ensure we can provide access to companies to support them in innovating? And just making sure that that process is open and people can continue to come and join and we can provide new opportunities for people. I don't think there's going to be one success. We're not just going to tick the box and walk off, but it will sort of integrate and become just one of the tools in the toolbox for healthcare professionals. But we can only do that by all of us coming together, collaborating effectively, ensuring that the needs of an SME, the needs of a global tech company, the needs of an individual patient are all heard and those viewpoints are appreciated. And that then we find solutions that will help everybody. I mean, Valea, yeah. from your point of view, what are the the critical, let's say, um, things we have to get right to yeah, get people embrace AI. Yeah, so I, I think first, yeah, to summarize, there are a number of things that are required to ensure we realize the full value of AI. Hmm. We must all agree on data normalization across different producers and make data available. Concepts and tools like federated learning, blockchain, allow us to make this happen by respecting data confidentiality. In certain cases, rethinking the way data is structured is another way to realizing the potential value for your organization. 
data production management will become a very sensitive task, I believe, as its quality will influence a lot of the quality of AI services. We'll have to make sure that data is of the best quality and double checked. Also, the technical development of AI computing means that software developers and chip designers like Intel work closely together for ultimate success. For example, AI computing needs what, we, what is called convolutional neural network, which is known as CNN. This is at the heart of developing AI algorithms and analyzing data. But the development of these chips is completely different compared to those used today. Introducing AI features to users, gradually even small ones, will be very helpful to end users. Far more productive than a massive leap of change in one go, which could cause change chaos. Part of this, I believe, is also about building models and software that can be constantly updated. <laughs> So, Simon, you, I think we can, see, we can say in healthcare, AI disruption is now imminent. Mm -hmm. Executives predict that it will be widely adopted over the next five years. So successful integration also means successful integration also, also means coordinating technology, but also people and processes. And a few examples of what I mean can be taken from the different stakeholders group that were mentioned a few, few minutes before. Firstly, physicians, they will be key to the testing of new features and functionalities. And they will probably benefit from double competency training, physician to engineer, so we gain maximum value on the feedback of AI systems. Secondly, patients on the whole. Currently, they don't trust artificial intelligence in healthcare. So we have to gain this trust by answering transparency. And by the way, the word trust I think is, all, is a very key among healthcare employees as currently they see AI as a tool to replace their jobs, which has been mentioned previously. So digital strategies will need to embrace employees. Then finally, the results of AI transformation as a re return on investment will have to be defined and monitored to secure the investor support. This is, I believe, Simon, what are the key uh, concepts to deal with, to make AI a success in the coming years. One question, I know that you, Nienke, I mean, you know at the end both worlds. It's a mm -hmm. corporate world, um, and now as a startup, I would say startup and the startup environment is known to do things differently. So what do you think at the end? Um, that's one question I have. Um, yeah, we should What do makes too. it a success, right? I think, um, and this is a topic close to my heart, um, we talk a lot about the technology itself. But I think to make it a success, uh, it's a journey, right? It's a journey from, of course, you need to have good technology, mm -hmm. but the adoption process and how that technology fits into the, um, the clinical practice, that's actually the heavy lifting, I would say. Um, I like the fact that you use the word transformation. It is transformation, but it's not, tra it's a transformation of the way people work in the hospital. It's a transformation of how each one aligns to the patient pathway. Mm -hmm. And I think um, we're just seeing the first success stories of this technology, but um, I think you hinted at that, Matthias, that yes, it's, we're early stage, but you need to, you have a choice, right? You come on board now and you start learning today. And it's not only learning, um, working with that new te technology, but also how that impacts your processes, as you mentioned. So you start either today and then you get yourself ready once the full potential comes in, right? And I think that's, for me, what makes it a success. I think if I would be very brief, making it a success is accepting that this is not only a technology implementation, it's a transformation, it's change management. Um, and I think you refer to it really nicely, bring everyone together. Yes, I strongly believe in it. You need to bring everyone together. You need a champion who's, who's pushing that process forward and sometimes breaking down silos. But yeah, to make it a success, I think it starts with realizing this is not only new technology, it's a transformation of your, uh, of your radiology department. Yeah. 
Yeah. For example. Yeah, I fully agree. It's a change management process and I, I firmly believe success will come to those who get behind the steering wheel fast. Yeah, exactly. But as a department head, you have to create an environment, I would say, yeah. where you can really, you know, blossom, where you can play with some stuff, where yeah. you can really see and have an open environment. Uh, so it, it starts, I would say, with people who are deciding, you know, and yeah. probably in the future, the role of a chairman of a department of radiology would be to to select the right AI tools but but create an environment um, you cannot force anyone to use AI I mean you ha you need some champions and they grow naturally yeah. and and then they kind of lead by example and then all the others uh, say wow this is cool I want to do it myself I, I think this is the way yeah. it is and it's a it's a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift because um, j just just imagine like 20 years ago when we introduced PACS into clinical radiology. I mean, yeah. in the beginning, it was a nightmare sometimes. No, because nothing yeah. worked. But now a world without PECs, I mean, uh, no one would, would live in a world without PECs, at least not as a radiologist. Yeah. Um, so, and, and the same will, will hopefully happen to AI. Don't get distracted because there are some failures in the beginning. And of course, not, any, not every algorithm that will be, um, 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 you know, that uh, developed will in the end turn out to be a good algorithm. And I think that's the important so it's not a magic bullet. It's not going to be perfect. There's not no. all going to be successes. And some of the things I think will be sharing those learnings. So those who do leap first can then pass that knowledge back and into the community to say, don't do this. Yeah, this didn't do work. Actually, yeah. you should share in our insights so that we bring everybody together because there can't be pockets of AI excellence and then you don't see that distributed across the, the healthcare system. So yeah. we're sharing that knowledge and making sure that um, those who leap first aren't the only ones to benefit. But I like the, the analogy of the PAX implementation, right? And I think that's also put the radiology department maybe in the forefront of this transformation, right? Because they've been through through a, that transformation They've through already. Pain, <laughs> They've say. been through pain, but they also... Learnings. <laughs> but they can still remember, right? So they yeah. can also remember the learnings. And I think if they approach that the same way as yeah. they learn from that learnings and they approach AI from that perspective, they could be leading this transformation in a hospital, I think. Mm -hmm. At where we had the point of learnings, and I know that, and I can be a little bit provocative here, mm -hmm. we from the industry, I don't know how you think, Valer, or you, Matthias, um, we are not the fastest one. So to be, what can we learn from companies like Aidens to basically be fast and um, also, um, yeah, uh, let's say, bring AI faster to market? Um, I can only talk from the agent's perspective. So I think w what I find that we do very well is focus. Don't try to solve world peace at day one. <laughs> um, but pick, pick a topic, pick a use case where you know it can add value and focus. Make that, go through that whole process, including bringing it to clinical practice. Learn from that and then see what you, else you can do, right? So I think if I could answer it with one word, focus. Focus on what creates impact and what creates value. But someone, I don't think you need to worry too much that G are being really slow. So <laughs> our experience in NCM has been that they're not quite as fast as the startups and SMEs, but surprisingly nimble for a large multinational organization. And so I think that you can be reassured everybody's ready to try and grasp this, but I think for an SME, you need focus. For a large organization, you need diversity, and yeah. you can really push the envelope on some of those trickier or f more pie in the sky ideas that an SME couldn't afford to be focused on. The, the big leaders have really got an opportunity to say, let's let's set out a whole pipeline of things we're going to be investing in. So. And as a large company, I mean, you need diversity. At the same time, you need focus. And that is yeah. that refers to my comment I made earlier. We have to listen. We have to listen to the customers. These are the pain points. This is what we like to solve. We, we, we have been wanting to yeah. solve this for 20 years and, and then focus. And of course, work with startups that show us, you know, uh, how to do it. And maybe to go a little bit deeper on this learning part. Valer, you mentioned before that there has to be cross-learning right now. An engineer yeah. has to also understand what um, a doctor is doing and, and vice versa. And I would get that there are more stakeholders at the end um, who come to this equation. I mean, Matthias, what are, I mean, you are an expert in AI as well. How do you basically bring this together? 
Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, that's the crystal ball. That's the big challenge, actually. I can only say we have medical expertise in, in GE Healthcare. Uh, I lead a team of people for, for Europe, and uh, um, we know the other side, I would say. We've, we've been you know, clinical doctors, clinical radiologists. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's important, and this is uh, what I see, that we also train our, our um, you know, commercial people. I mean, we cannot turn them into radiologists. That, that is not <laughs> The, no, that is not the task, but they have to be able to survive a 60-minute conversation w w with the chairman of a comprehensive cancer center. So they need some kind of medical knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, no one demands that they know everything, you know, perfectly, you know. But but to have a first discussion and um, come back with the feedback, and then if there is interest, okay, we bring the specialists. And uh, this also, um, you know, refers to AI development. You know, to some extent, um, th th that's. My hope is that, that everyone in, in G Healthcare who is customer facing has, has a clue of what it is, yeah. what is the impact, and uh, you know, get some new ideas talking to customers. But I think also be aware of what you can bring, right? I think specifically companies like GE, I mean, we, we, we are, as agents, we, we need to focus, right? Because we're small. But I think there's also an opportunity for companies like GE. I mean, there will be a hunger for knowledge, also knowledge about how the modalities work, how, how things work. And I think people in G, companies like GE should also be aware that they bring that knowledge, right? Of course, you go there and mm -hmm. you, you understand what their needs are, but you also have knowledge. And I think with AI starting to emerge, there is a hunger at customers as well to understand more. How is it working? Can you tell me? And that's where engineering companies and healthcare companies can add value, sure. right? Well, on that knowledge economy, though, I think this is one area for AI. We're all going to be competing or collaborating yeah. around expertise in AI, machine learning, the statisticians, yeah. mathematicians, computer scientists. The SMEs, the big companies, academia, hospitals, all need this expertise. And there's not enough of this to go around. So we are going to have to work together because yeah. you can't, not everybody's going to become a machine learning neural net guru. And neither should they. <laughs> no. But it, we all need to be close enough and be able to share that expertise and the resources and train people together and allow them to move between the different organizations. Be able to speak the language. I think. Yeah, yeah, a common yeah, language, yeah. And as you said earlier, there's a role for everyone in the system. Yeah. I like yeah. that. Look, I see another question coming up, um, which is at the end. Um, oh, it's about uh, the black box. So will the AI black box be a barrier to success, to maybe rephrase this? At the end, this black box concept, um, if you don't know actually how an algorithm um, will take decision, you may fear it, correct? That um, mm -hmm. comes right back to the beginning. And Nienke, I know that you mentioned this concept. Yeah. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on this? Is at the end this black box? What do we have to do to, to really break this barrier? Yeah, I, I, we tapped upon this already, right? And it's good, I think, that the question is, is, is asked. Um, it would be typical in Aiden's lunch session question as well, mm. because this <laughs> is something where uh, what comes up, right? Um, and and it's, it's, it's something I think it's a, ju a justifiable question. You mentioned earlier about trust. I think if we want to gain the trust of adoption, we shouldn't... Uh, move away from this question, right? But we should try to answer it. And, and the first thing I would like to say is um, the black box will never go completely away, right? So I think one of the challenges is what we need to see how we can do that is we need to get comfortable that part of it will stay a black box. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a couple of things we can do. We can be honest as what we said in the beginning as well. I think vendors can be much more even communicating, maybe even over communicating is how do we train? How do we validate? What does validation mean? Um, what does it mean if you look at a certain data set? What questions do you need to ask? Um, whether that algorithm would fit your patient population. I think that's one thing which you can address. Um, and, and I think that's required as well for yourself. And that comes back to the other thing, the training, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to work maybe with, with societies as well to say, how do you add aspects of AI to the curriculum um, that 
helps medical professionals to ask the right questions. And Ninka, I think that's something, so the topple review. Yeah, and the UK, and the issued last year, I think, has sort of indicated that there is this massive training need for the healthcare yeah. system as a whole to understand what are the questions I should be asking, mm -hmm. what is the information I need to be aware of, how do I yeah. approach the companies to figure out whether this is a good solution or not, and that training the workforce and be able to know what those questions are is something that I think we've started to see in the UK tackled around genomic medicine and the idea of yeah. integrating whole genome sequencing but isn't that yet there for AI but the, again the review suggested that within 10 years 90% of the workforce will be impacted by yeah. AI and imaging so everybody will need to upskill and so addressing that training need yeah. is that did the SMEs train people mm. did the big companies is this yeah. NHS who 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 comes together who picks up right who picks up the baton and I think we need to start now because the, the algorithms we see today they're still doing that repetitive easy task, but you already see a shift there. There will be algorithms out there who, for example, will do malignancy prediction, right? And then it's very important that you start understanding what do I see in the results and also what is not, what the result is not giving me, right? So I would say um, the black box, I think there will always be part of this black box, but um, yeah, we need to start thinking about training and how do we address that um, to make them feel comfortable with that. And healthcare is a business of trust. I guess yeah. everyone on the panel here mentioned that. And um, you know, explainable AI is is, is very important yeah. for it to be successful. You know, uh, when people don't have the transparency, they don't see why a decision you know is made. I mean, it's really tough to get this accepted, right? And yeah. um, I agree with you. There cannot be probably you know a hundred percent you know explainable or outside of the black box. But I think all efforts, you know, from from industry, from yeah. startups, also academia, have to go in that direction. Yeah. That we make this, uh, you know, in order to. Otherwise, people are afraid, of course, yeah. and, and I, I can understand. In order to make AI successful, uh, it, it needs to get out of the black box for exactly. sure. Exactly. I mean, look, guys. Also, in I see that our time is nearly over. I think we we traveled really a long way. We started with uh, <laughs> with um, in the beginning with uh, the fear. We talked about how to address it. I mean, many interesting um, concepts here. I still will not go into a plane. <laughs> <laughs> and then we came over and looked where AI basically has the first impact. And the, the, not the first, the, the, um, the best impact. It could be back office. I like this time of three steps there, starting with implementing to machines and systems, then next um, co um, covering departments, and at the end, entire systems. Um, we talked a lot about what's needed um, to get AI um, yeah, implemented and to be a success. A big one here was trust, transparency, I heard. I heard the term of collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Quite a lot there, which um, I also see in this panel coming all from, from different positions. I would like to close um, with a question for each of you, one by one. So the, fir um, the same question, but I would like to get um, your answer. Where do you see the biggest um, disruption potential of AI um, today? To close, Matthias. Mm -hmm. So if, if I had to pick one, I think AI will help to reestablish the human connection between um, the, the patient and the clinician, the radiologist. So uh, I would say um, AI will make medicine human again. So and just Claire. to follow on, I think it, that patient component, so how do we empower patients to engage in their own healthcare decision making, monitoring their own experience, being engaged in that decision making. And then hopefully we'll get to the point where you do see earlier detection, diagnosis, that again, it's behind the scenes and it's integrated seamlessly, but it is improving the way that we're, healthcare is delivered and patients are benefiting from it. Well, yeah. Yeah, so I believe that the most disruption will probably come in medical activities based on complex data in radiology, pathology, or genomics. Also, where multiple data sources are used to monitor patient status, AI will take charge of repetitive tasks where machines are better than humans to free up the physician and allow him to concentrate on more complex tasks. This is where humans are far better than machines. AI also, AI also has already started to change healthcare, report dictation, uh, medical uh, image uh, post-treatment, uh, 3D reconstruction, natural language processing for electronic health records, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, areas already. AI will bring more and more support to the physicians and the healthcare organizations. So for instance, 
uh, we can imagine that uh, digital pathology services, genome interpretation services, radiology interpretation services at large scale, at country scale, at region scale, with few, where we have fewer physicians and where there are currently not enough of them. Thanks, Nika. Yeah, I think there's there's many opportunities where AI can disrupt. I think what I where I think it's important is that we look what I said earlier beyond the technical implementation. I think if we all get start understanding that adoption of AI is is goes beyond technical implementation is all about change management, then I'm um, I'm very positive about the future, and I th I'm very positive uh, for the medical uh, professionals. I think their future is very bright. And I think the future is even brighter for the patients because I think once we embrace it, um, there will, the care delivery, care delivery will definitely improve. It's actually a, a real better I couldn't close, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you put me into a bad, decision, a bad position here. But no. <laughs> Look, I really thank you guys for, for your time. I think it's important when I listen to you, um, the main comments at the end, what I take away here is that the positive um, will, weigh, um, will be way bigger than the challenges we have in AI. So um, as the title says at the end, don't fear AI. I think the mantra for us would be to embrace it. Thanks for your time. And I also thank the audience. Um, we, will, we didn't cover all questions, but we follow up on them for sure. Thanks a lot. <laughs>